Welcome to the season premiere of Illinois Pioneers. I'm David Inge. In the weeks ahead, Illinois Pioneers will celebrate people who've made significant contributions to life in Illinois. They work in many fields, business, politics, the arts, education, and sport. My first guest came from a small sharecropper's farm in O.K., Oklahoma, population 300. He grew up to become one of the all-time winningest college basketball coaches in NCAA history. He retired as the all-time leader in victories at both the University of Illinois and New Mexico State. He coached the Illini to 12 NCAA tournament appearances, including the 1989 Flying Illini Final Four team. I am very pleased to welcome to Illinois Pioneers, Coach Lou Henson. Hey, thank you very much for being here. Nice to be here I'm with you, sure. Dave. Uh, people can go over your record. I don't want to take time. It would take too much time. One other thing, in addition to the things that I mentioned here at the, the Open that I mentioned, is that you are one of only 11 coaches who have taken two different teams to the Final Four. Of course. Uh, Dave, coaching is important, but to win, you've got to have personnel. And uh, in high school, we had good personnel. We won three state championships and uh, had better people than other folks. And on the college level, we've done a pretty good job of recruiting at those institutions. And uh, you win with people. Yeah. Your academic background is in education. At Mexico State, you got bachelor's and master's degrees in education. And then right out of college, you went into coaching, to first in high school and, and Las Cruces, and then in Abilene at a, a small college there. Was that something that you always knew that you wanted to do? When I, I stayed on coach the freshman team at New Mexico State after graduated, and, and uh, uh, that year uh, I uh, didn't have a job, and so uh, uh, they were off offered me a job at Las Cruces High School, and uh, I coached there for six years and had good ball clubs, and uh, then I was teaching math with a fella just down the hall. And he said, the job at Hardin Simmons University is open. It was major at the time. He said, why don't you apply? I said, Ray, I'm not going to apply. They wouldn't hire a high school coach. Well, it so happened his dad was president of the university. And about two weeks, his dad called and said, now, Lou, would you come down and talk to us about this basketball job? And I said, I'd be delighted. So when I was, as a matter of fact, Bob King came from Iowa. He's the new coach at the University of New Mexico, and he had offered me the assistant's job. And so uh, I went to Hardin-Simmons. I interviewed with the athletic board, and uh, so they offered me the job. Now, they had never been integrated before, never had black players. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I told the board, I said, well, you know, I'd take this job. It's a major and job, and I would take it if you integrate the team. Well, they kind of leaned back, didn't know what to think about that. Well, they met, the trustees were meeting that night, and would you believe they decided to do it? So we integrated the basketball team, the university. I went to Mississippi and, and recruited two black players. And back then, it was different in Texas. We couldn't feed them in restaurants. So we'd have to stop at drive-ins and feed them or, or take uh, sack lunches. And, and we had a few problems, but uh, we were happy to do it. Why did you think that was so important? Well, I, I'd always coached black players, and I was going to take the job if they were going to be all white. I was mm -hmm. determined that uh, that I wanted to integrate the school, uh, or I would not accept the job, and uh, and I told him that. Yeah, I mentioned that in the introduction, your dad was a sharecropper, and I expect some people watching might ha not have any idea what that is. What does that mean? Well, I grew up on a farm, and uh, and so. Uh, and, uh, and did work day and day. We at one time, we, and by the way, we didn't have facilities like you do today. We were milking 35 head of cattle and the crops and all. So, uh, but it's really interesting. Uh, uh, we lived on a farm near Wagner, Oklahoma, which is about 8,000. But I was playing baseball for the superintendent schools and basketball coach at OK. And as I was playing this summer, he said, why don't you, I'll come by and pick you up. He lived in Wagner. I'll pick you up and take you to school every day if you go to school at our place. So I was a recruited athlete from the eighth grade. <laughs> and this, so tell me about OK. What, what's, the, what's the town of OK, Oklahoma like? OK is about 300. A very small place. Uh, there were 13 of a graduating class, six boys. And so uh, uh, it was, we had, we only had four teachers, but they were outstanding teachers. And, uh, and I might mention this, in six boys in my class, four of them went on to get PhDs. Now, that is so unusual. In a school like that, you might have one over a period of 25 years, but we had four 
in my in my yeah. class that uh, got PhDs. One uh, from the University of Illinois. So your uh, so your dad your dad was a tenant farmer. Right. You did not own the land. No. You worked it, and then you got a percentage of, that, of whatever came correct. out of it. So so you came up. You you were not a, a wealthy young man. Well, most farmers back in those days weren't. You know, you work for a living, and yeah. that was it. So how did uh, I understand your dad didn't really think uh, much of your playing sports? No, he didn't. He would rather be there on the farm and work. But I would work and then get my basketball in. And worked at home, worked at school, and and so uh, I think later on he realized that I got became a pretty good high school player and. Uh, had scholarships, and so uh, he was happy about that. Yeah, I, I uh, also read that uh, you didn't really have a lot of uh, much in the way of equipment when you were trying to learn how to shoot basketball. Well, no, we had we had a rag ball in the front yard, little basket. We'd work on that before we got a basketball. Back then, you could buy basketballs for two or three dollars. And another thing, you know, the price of tennis shoes. $150, $200. Yeah. The first pair of good shoes I bought, I was paying for two, two, a couple of bucks a pair, and uh, I, I could buy a, a pair of Converse for three ninety five. dollars My dad said, there's no way I'm going to pay that kind of money for a pair of tennis shoes. And so it goes to show now, look what they cost. Yeah. Big family came from? Uh, seven in our family. Uh, and so... Uh, Boys and girls, we have uh, we have six boys and one girl. Yeah. Other your uh, brothers uh, athletically inclined? Uh, no, no. One other brother played college ball, but uh, and he also went into coaching. But uh, the two of us are the only ones who played. My sister played high school basketball. So that must have been uncommon at that time for girls to. They didn't have the opportunities. Who didn't know how to play sports? Well, they don't have. They didn't have the opportunity, but they did have girls' teams. But they weren't very good. But uh, they've made tremendous progress in the last several years. Yeah, it seems to me one of the things about uh, basketball that maybe separates it from some other team sports is that you know at any given time each side's only got five guys out there on the court, which seems to me creates the opportunity for for one or two players to dominate play, which you can't, you know, if everybody wants to shoot all the time, you got a problem. So how do you, and I realize this is a, this is a fundamental question in coaching, but how do you take this group of individuals and make them a team? Well, first of all, you have A players, hopefully, B players, C players, maybe even have D players. Uh, hopefully you don't have many of those. But uh, what you do at, as a coach, you try to make the A players better. And the B players, you try to move them up, C players. And uh, yeah, I started out coaching in high school, so I, I've stressed fundamentals not only on the high school level, but, but in college. And uh, and I think that's so important. And uh, And you try to develop your players because you're no better than the players you have playing for you. Yeah. When you first went to New Mexico State, the year before you got there, they uh, had a record of 4 and 22. In your first year as coach, they finished 15 and 11 and went to the NCAA tournament. What did you do when you took over there at New Mexico State? First of all, I was hired at Simmons University and had some good ball clubs there. And uh, so I was offered the job at New Mexico State and I went over there and, and I accepted the job, went into the basketball office and the coaching staff had been fired. And, and so the window was up and sand was in there as a mess. They had changed clothes in the, in, the, in the office. And I called my wife and said, look, we made a mistake. I'm coming back to Abilene. Well, she said, no, you're not. You're going to stay there. <laughs> well. The first year, and we hadn't beaten UTEP in maybe 15 games, and uh, we had a couple of little guards and uh, two little forwards, a 6'5 postman. Now, Texas Western at that time, that was their name, they had won the national title the year before. And so uh, we had to go against them, and we were going down to El Paso to play, and I told my wife, if we don't get beat more than 30, 35 points, I'll be happy. We had them down 18 points with three to go and beat them 13. They had everybody back from the national champs but one. And so we had a good team. They nicknamed this team the Miracle Midgets because they split with another top five team and went on to the NCAA. I've never had a team perform quite like this one. Uh, nobody could believe what was happening. Yeah. Well, and uh, uh, I mentioned before that you're, you're one of a very small number of coaches that has taken two, two different teams to the Final Four. In the history of New Mexico State, they went to Final Four once. 
during the time that you were coach. Was it 70? Right. As a matter of fact, uh, in 1968, we met UCLA. They had Jabbar and all those star players. They won it all. And they beat us in a close game in Albuquerque. Now, the next year, we went to NCAA. That was in the regionals. The next year, we had to play them at Poly Pavilion at UCLA, and they beat us there. Well, they moved us out of that district and moved us into another one. So we went on and met them again in the Final Four, College Park, Maryland, and uh, and they beat us again. So three years in a row, we had a team that could possibly win the national title had we not gone up against UCLA. They were winning 10 national titles, and nobody could beat UCLA. Yeah. Well, that's a tough thing about the tournament. You know, you, you don't know who you're going to end up playing, and the chances are you're, you may well, uh, early on at least, end up being mat just totally overmatched. So then as a coach, what, how, how do you talk to the players about that? Well, you know, we knew we were up against a tough team at UCLA. We felt confident about beating anyone else. We had tremendous records during those years, and our 68 team might have been better than the Final Four team in 1970. But again, UCLA is just too much for us. But uh, we knew we were good, and they knew we were good. But, uh, hey, I'm sure they didn't have a lot of confidence going against UCLA because yeah. they knew how great they really were. I I'm, I'm, would like to have you talk about the relationship between the coach and the and the players, particularly how that may have changed over time now that you have so many young men in college that are looking to a career in, uh, in the NBA. Well, I, in, in coaching, um, <clears throat> the key to coaching, first of all, you've got to have discipline. You can't do much of anything unless you have discipline. And then you've got to try to develop, develop your players and uh, bring them along. I think it's so important to have a good relationship with your players. Now, you have to have the discipline, but uh, you need good uh, morale. And the best way to get that is try to be uh, positive because you're trying to make a player better. Mm -hmm. So if you jump on him all the time about uh, his weaknesses, then he may get worse. So we always try to encourage them and uh, try to bring them along and see them develop. Yeah. Well, now, you know, particularly now that... Um that professional basketball has become so big and we have people making astonishing salaries and I'm sure there are a lot of college players who go into college and that's what they're thinking they're going to do. Um, does that make it less likely, do you think, they're actually going to listen to their coach? They're going to say, look, coach, you're not my dad, okay? Uh, I know what I'm doing here. Just let me do it because in two years, I, you know, I'm going to be out of here. How, how do coaches deal with that? Of course, I've, I've only had one to go to the pros early, so we didn't have a problem. But uh, like the one-and-done rule, that's a bad rule because they can enroll in college freshman year and not do much academically, then go to the pros. We need to eliminate that. That is a very bad rule. Now, speaking of salaries, I must tell you this, Dave. My first year I coached, I, I taught five math classes, had study hall, and did duty behind the school. That's where the kids were smoking and doing things like that. <laughs> I brought home $271 a month. And another thing I might say, the first 10 years that I coached, uh, I made a total of uh, 50000 That was 5000 a year. So years ago, coaches didn't get paid much, and now it's hard to believe what they're getting. Yeah, and now I, I think there are something like close to 40 college basketball coaches that make over a million dollars a year. That's just, that to you that must be as to me it's kind of astonishing to you that must be astonishing. It really is. Let me tell you about uh, w about 3 years ago or 4 we had a call in show had the retired coaches and we were talking about national basketball and uh, this one lady called and John Wooden was one of them. So this lady called in and said coach Wooden at UCLA you won 10 national titles. You had great teams. And I can't believe what I heard. I heard your last year at UCLA, you only made 36000 He said, Miss, I want to correct you. My last year at UCLA, I made thirty two five. after all those national titles. Who, you know, I don't, I don't know how one learns to be a coach. I, and maybe in part you learn by doing it. But I'm sure that coaches need mentors just like players need mentors. So who did you learn from? Of course, I had two or three really good coaches. I had a coach in high school. He he is he, he liked the Iba style. Iba was a great coach at Oklahoma State, and then Bobby Jack Rogers, a great coach, and Presley Askew at New Mexico State. 
uh, was a tremendous coach. And, and I think you really need to play for good coaches. It makes it a lot easier to be a coach if you've learned from top people. Yeah. I think you're, you're someone, you know, there, there are coaches who are famous for having short fuses. And as far as I can see, you've never been one of them. In fact, you're someone people always talk about how emotionally restrained you are. Um, I did, though, come across a really nice quote from a fellow named Richard Robinson, who played for you at New Mexico State in the mid-'70s. He said of you, he's almost Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You meet him on the street or restaurant, and he's the gentleman's gentleman. When you put on the practice gear, though, and step between those lines, it's all business. There are no excuses. You are held accountable. That's exactly right. It is business. And, uh, and, and by the way, the people, the public, I'd like to say, have one or two go to the locker room and they'll find <laughs> out I'm not that nice guy. <laughs> well, that's, a, you know, you always wonder really what, what goes back, what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, and the other thing is, you, you know, you, you know, you have to know how much pressure there is during the game. And you're there on the sidelines. You can't step over the line. You can't go out there and shoot the ball yourself. It must, you just must be all emotionally churned up inside. You know, as you know, Dave, I'm a bridge player. And I found out playing bridge, if I'm not as good as the people I'm going against or my partner, if he expects too much out of me, it, it bothers me. As a coach, I never expected too much out of a player because instead of helping them, it makes them worse. If you expect them to do something they can't do, so you should never do that. Well, what do you, so do you then just know that you have these players, they have these skills, you take advantage of those skills, and then if you need something else done, that guy can't do it, well, you don't ask him to do it? That is correct. Uh, in other words, at the beginning of each fall, we shoot the three-point shot for six weeks. We record everything, and at the end of the six weeks, we know who can shoot the three-point shot and who can't. So the ones who can't, they know they can't shoot it. They, they can't make three-point shots, so we let the ones who can make the threes shoot them. So uh, we pretty well let a player know where he stands. We try to, we try to be honest with him, and uh, I think it's so important to be honest, be concerned about your education, and if you are, you'll get the respect of the players. Yeah, I'm sure people ask you about the, the, the best teams, the most remarkable teams, the favorite teams, and people keep coming back to the 89 team. I think one of the things that I read about that team, and I went back and read some old articles uh, about it, was that here, certainly your starters, if not everybody, were, they were like utility players. They could, they could do everything. They could run, they could pass, they could shoot, they could play any position, and it, and it didn't matter, and that was maybe one of the strengths of that team. In 1984, along in there, we had really good ball clubs. We went to the finals of the regionals and had to play Kentucky at Kentucky and lost a two or three point ball game. That team could have possibly won a national title. The 89 team was voted the best team in the nation. Going in, everybody thought we were going to win it. Well, we'd beaten Michigan badly, had them down 25 at Michigan, beat them 17. And then we met them again in the uh, final four. But in the regionals, what, I'll tell you what happened to us. We had two key players injured, Kenny Battle, we were it's an old place. The, the arena there was leaking. He slept on water, sprained his leg, and he only got two points. He only played in a few minutes. And that game, Lowell Hamilton, another starter, sprained his ankle. That game was a miracle. We did it basically with the second string players and two or three starters. We beat, we beat them by 16 points, and they were a great ball club. That's probably one of the best victories I've ever been associated with. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about the, you know, what happened when you went back to New Mexico State. This was in, in 1997. And there was this big dust up there between the school and the coach who was fired days before practice was supposed to start. And I'd read that you were hesitant about going back there. Well, I had planned to coach again. And uh, when they first called me along and... Uh, Long in September, uh, and my wife and I decided, no, we would not do it. Well, the athletic director called again and said, now, we may have to make a change. Would you consider it? I said, well, let's think about it. Well, my wife, Mary, and I, we talked about it. We said, okay, 
If they want us to come down, we'll coach for a year uh, uh, and with a the stipulation they won't pay me anything. Because we were drawing our retirements from uh, the University of Illinois. We didn't need to have it. So, uh, so I went down and uh, coached for $1 a year because I did it for nothing. But in order to... For me to coach, they had to pay me a dollar a year. There was, there was some kind of, actually, the law said you could not uh, volunteer, be a volunteer coach. That they is had to correct. pay you something. So, you said, so okay, they paid me a dollar a year, and they, everybody else got checks after each month. Well, on mine, they paid me after three months. At the end of three months, my net salary was 78 cents. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, the, I, I read that you, you went there thinking, well, this is going to be there six months, be temporary. It didn't turn out that way. Well, we had a pretty good ball club the first year, won 18, 20 ball games. And uh, during the Christmas break, the AD took us up to Rio Dosa, which is a resort area, and entertained us two, three or four days. And he said, now, yeah, I really need you to stay for a while. And so I agreed to do it. And we had pretty good ball clubs there. So we coached for uh, a few more years after that. Yeah. I, I mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, there are some coaches that are famous for their temper. And maybe one of the most famous happened to be a neighbor over in Indiana, and I'm thinking about Bob Knight, uh, and who coached there for a long time and was a very successful coach until I believe in 2000, I think the school there decided that they had to come to a parting of the ways. And uh, one of the things that I read that you once said about him, you said that he was a classic bully. And people will maybe recall the famous chair throwing incident, which you can still see today on YouTube if you really want to. Wh what do you think about Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight was a tremendous basketball coach and uh, actually many of those years we got along really well. Uh, we had a run in or two and Bob Knight told me after that he said uh, don't worry about that with me I have run in with everybody and he's probably right about that. At some point uh, he will probably have a disagreement with other coaches. Well was that just was that could he not help himself or was that some kind of strategy to focus attention on him rather than on the players? I can't answer that. I just don't know for sure. I know he has a temper, but I don't know any. I don't know whether it's that or something else. So, of, of all of the coaches that that you have known, who do you think was the the best, or a couple of the top coaches? You know, that's really hard to say. But there there are a lot of good coaches. If you look at your top fifty coaches, I think you're splitting hairs. Now, the coaches that are winning. They're the ones who recruit well and have good players. Uh, uh, I think fans uh, have a tendency to put too much stock in whether you win or not. And uh, it all goes back to the coach is responsible for winning, but therefore he has to recruit. If he doesn't recruit, he won't last long. Basketball and athletics in general, it's big business. And after a period of time, you really need to be successful. Yeah. Do you think that sometimes the, the, the employer, so I guess that would be, I don't know if it would be athletic associations or would, there would be the leadership of schools, they don't give chance, the coaches the chance to develop themselves or develop their teams and people are shown the door too quickly? I think that happens. Most coaches get four or five years uh, to uh, develop a team and you need in football you need at least four or five in basketball if you get a couple of guys you can probably win early and that's what we did at New Mexico State uh, won the first year but uh, it's difficult to do most of the time it takes time and basketball and football it takes much more time yeah. well and I'm, I'm sure you know if you look at the uh, old films of, of basketball games and you compare that to, to play today I'm sure even somebody like me who is not not an authority on sports, could see that the style of play is different. So how would you des describe the differences, say, between the way the game is played now and, say, when you were in high school and you were playing? Okay, it is, it's not even the same game. When I was in high school, the athletes weren't that good. We have better coaches, better training, and uh, so there, and we just have more good players. So... Uh, the game has never been better than what it is now. And the Final Four, that's a spectacle. Uh, I don't think even the Super Bowl can really match that. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about, uh, give you a chance to talk about your health because within the last 10 years or so, you've faced some really serious challenges. You were diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2003. Is that right? Uh, and uh, at one point... You were really sick, and talk about 
you know, what kind of, what you've been through. Well, Dave, through the years, I never had any health issues at all. And so uh, I'd go in to get a physical, and, and Jeff Kerouac, my doctor, ten, he was a team physician here at Illinois, and my physician, he'd poke around on my stomach, and I thought, ah, this is a waste of time. I shouldn't even be down there. <laughs> well, that year, he said, yeah, I better give you a CAT scan. So he found a tumor. It was way back in the back, and uh, he was lucky to have found it. And uh, Kind of find out stage four, and uh, so uh, I took strong chemo and uh, got it in remission. My uh, cancer cannot be cured; you can just put it in remission. And so, uh, uh, about three months, and I was coaching at the time. I coached that year. At the time, uh, uh, we had a recruit in, and uh, on the, I'll remember this date forever. September the twenty-third. I didn't feel like eating. I told the recruit and the coaches, "I'll see you tomorrow morning for breakfast." I didn't wake up for three and a half weeks. I was in the hospital there for two weeks, then they'll pass on another hospital. And when I woke up, I was wondering where I was and what was happening. So uh, what, no, this was, this was, I guess, as I understand it, you had this intense chemo. It really hit your immune system hard. Then, then you contracted viral encephalitis? That is correct. See, and, and that's right. The chemo is so strong, it compromised my immune system, and that's why I... Uh, came down with viral encephalitis. That is a disease inflammation of the brain. It's very much like a stroke. And uh, for several months, uh, I couldn't walk. I didn't have any movement in one leg. As a matter of fact, I had two problems. And at my age then, you're lucky to come out of it, really, because I was in coma a lot of the time. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. But uh, <clears throat> I came out, my leg was paralyzed, and I had a mental problem. I took speech therapy for two years, and I came out, I knew nothing, I, and one of the first questions this speech therapist asked me, uh, who discovered America? And I was trying to think, no, I should know that, I'm trying to think of that, and I was stalling, I said, would you mind repeating the question? <laughs> so she did. Well, anyway, to show you how bad it was, we had a little machine, she'd say, okay, if you have two consecutive dots or sounds, you hit it. And if you have one, you don't. Well, I'd get confused, get confused on that. I mean, I came out and didn't know anything. But I was lucky because I came out of it. A lot of people with that, with the inflammation of the brain, they never come out of yeah. it. So I feel very fortunate. So you, so you had, the, had these memory issues. You had paralysis in one leg. So for several months, you were in, in a wheelchair. But you have made remarkably a uh, recovery here really come back because of hard work, obviously. What was it that, that pulled you through this, do you think? Well, physically, I worked hard. I realized that's why I swim five days a week. And, uh, and, I, and when I had speech therapy for two years, the speech therapist said, now, what you need to do is go ahead and read, do crossword puzzles. You like to play cards, play cards. You need to do that. You need to continue to do that. Well, that's when I started playing cards five days a week. I do crossword puzzles every day. And, uh, so uh, I never will forget here about two or three years ago, my wife and I were watching public television and uh, they had two brain specialists on and toward the end of the show, this one brain said, you know, if you don't use your mind and you don't use your body, your mind will deteriorate sooner. So that's what I've tried to do. Yeah. Well, what do you, uh, tell me about, uh, I know you're a big bridge player. What is it about the game that you find fascinating? Well, party bridge is one kind of game. Now, uh, duplicate is a very difficult game. Not many people play it. Uh, you have to study. I've studied for three or four years, and I'm a decent player now, but uh, it's a great game, and uh, you, you play bridge for three, three and a half hours. You have to think on every play. So that's why it's such a good uh, brain exercise for you. Yeah. I, I, uh, I know that people, you have a reputation for being competitive in everything that you do, in that is one case. But I've got to ask you this question. I, I came across this story, it's just so wonderful, and I want to know that it's really true, that at one point, and this is some years ago, you had a gallstone, and you were going to have surgery, and you had a buddy who also was going to have the same surgery, and you bet a steak dinner on who was going to have the bigger stone when it was removed. Now, what did you do to win the bet? Okay, now, first of all, Bob Evans, who was president of the Rebounders at the time, and uh, a friend of mine forever, we did have that bet. And so 
I was going to take mine down to his place. So instead, and I had a pretty big one, but I went out and found a rock that's quite a bit bigger. <laughs> you went out so in I your yard. It, I took it down. Rock. I won the bet. I don't think I ever told him any difference. Did you? So you never <laughs> told. See, I was wondering if you if you might have fessed up, and he said, "Well, that's okay. I'll I'll buy I, dinner. later on. I probably later I didn't do it for a long time. Okay. So uh, I, I want to make sure we're coming down to the end of our time, but I do want to make sure that, uh, that I give you a chance to talk about the relationship that I know is is most important in your life, and that's the relationship with your wife. There's no question about it. We met many, many years ago, and uh, uh, she uh, she was a cheerleader in high school, so she's sports-minded. In college, she majored in English, so you know what? She's always correcting my grammar all the time, which I don't like. Uh, but uh, that was that's a big thing. And one thing I want to mention to you, that there are two things we're really proud of here at the University of Illinois. When I came here, they hadn't been to, they'd been to one NCAA game in 25 years, we didn't have any fan support. We only had 3,000 people at the first game. And we had news media down on the floor, nobody else. So we organized the Orange Crush in our living room. We started with seven students. We bought 60 shirts and uh, we got it going. Now, Bob Blackman was the head football coach. He was pushing blue. We decided to push orange. You go to a game, very few people had orange on. That's when I started wearing the orange sport coat and pushing orange. Now look where it is. So, that's it. so now when you see the assembly hall and it's the sea of orange, you're the guy that's... We got the Orange Crush started and uh, we still work with them all the time. We, uh, the board, we entertain them in their home and we sit on the bench at least one game a year. It's a great organization. They raise a ton of money to help charities. And uh, now another thing, we didn't have a booster club. We organized the booster club and now they must have 800, 900. It's a huge booster club raising a lot of money for basketball. So does that, that kind of fan support does that really matter to the players? There's no question. You need the booster club. And uh, see what happens. The students here, the Orange Crush, are so good. They create a lot of enthusiasm. And that permeates through the crowd. It gets everybody else going. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm almost embarrassed to ask this question. But, you know, when you do a web search of your name, you know, various kinds of things will come up. And, but one of the things that comes up is Lou Henson hair. And I know that over time you got a lot of teasing and got a lot, a lot of attention about hair. And it was Di and and Dick Vitale. I think he was the guy that that coined the phrase the Ludo for your hair. Was that okay, or was at some point did you think uh, enough talking? About I didn't think anything about it, but uh, Dick Vitale, our Final Four team, he should have been talking about the team. He <laughs> talked about my hair all the time. Well, that's the thing, you know, that's, a, and if you, if you have a coach that has any kind of personality at all, I suppose that that, that person's going to get a lot of attention, which also makes me wonder whether that's part, you know, whether that's kind of part of the deal, whether the, the coach is thinking, well, if I soak up a lot of the attention, then that takes some of the pressure off the players. D I mean, d does that, does that happen? Uh, well, it, it could happen. Uh, I never looked at it like that. Uh, but uh, anyway, on, uh, I wrote a book after the 89 team. And uh, the first chapter deals with my hair. First chapter. So anyway, if you don't have a copy of that book, I'll give you one, Dave. I think you should read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There, you know, there, you, you talked a little bit earlier about the health challenges you, you face and then the fact that, that you, one time you were really sick. We were, we're very sick. Uh, and I guess there was a chance that you might, might not have made it. it. It was a tough go for about two or three weeks. So does that, having been there and then having come back from that. How does that shape a person's attitude toward daily life? Well, I'll tell you one thing, you're just, you're so pleased that you recovered and doing pretty well and you're happy to be healthy. And one thing I might throw in that's really bad, if you're really sick in the hospital, I suggest that you have somebody there with you because my wife was there one time when a nurse made a mistake, and had she not been there, I won't go into detail, had, a, had she not been there, I wouldn't have lived very long. So if you're really sick, I suggest you have somebody in there with you some of the time. So I, uh, I read a, a couple of different things. One thing, and, and you're talking about your wife, where you said you, you thought, maybe you're just speaking for yourself, that it was love at first sight. I also read that when you asked her out the first time, she said no. Oh, yes. 
She did you have, have to ask her? To do with it. Did you have to ask? How many times did you have to ask before she would finally? Well, go finally out? later on. Now I worked at the canning company in Freeport, Illinois, and she lived on a farm out there, so she worked there too. And she, I saw her come by, and that back early in the summer, I asked her for a date. She wouldn't do it, and finally she agreed to a date. So we had her first date August the first, and uh, and I guess I was lucky that. Uh, she yeah. thought a little bit of me, and we got married. Yeah, I'm really, uh, well, I'm, and you've been married 56 years? 50, 58. 58 yeah. years. I'm impressed that you remember the date that is the calendar date of your first date. Oh, I remember that, and I have to remember the date we got married. Now, what was confusing is we got married on 29th, and her mom and dad got married on 28th, and I kept getting those confused, but I had to remember it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're just at the part, about at the, the point where we're, we're going to have to finish. And, and, uh, and again, I just uh, I think your record is kind of stunning and, and, and speaks for itself. Uh, when you, you know, look at those stats, and to, to you, is that more than just numbers? Can you, can, is, it, is it like with the first date? Can you look at at dates or, or individual games and say, yes, I remember that. And I remember here where the turning point was. And I remember here, I should have done something else. Sure, I remember all that, uh, Dave. But I look back at my record and the wins and all, and that was really nice. But you know, the most enjoyment is uh, the players that I worked with, the relationship I have with the players and the fans. One of the best things we did is to come to the University of Illinois. I, on the, when I came up here to visit, I visited Oklahoma. They offered me the job, but I picked Illinois because Mary is from Illinois, and uh, it's one of the best things. Of course, it's a great university academically, and we've been pretty good in sports, and not all the time, but most of the time we've been pretty good in sports, and the people in Illinois are great, and in this community, so I owe a lot to the University of Illinois and the people of the state. Yeah. So if, if, I, if I, I know this is a, sort of a difficult question, but you know, if, if I said to you, well, do you have a philosophy on life, what would you say? Well, of course, I've always tried to, uh, uh, we go, we, uh, we're Christians, and we try to live that life, and that's, I think that's very important. I think everybody needs faith, and, uh, and we have faith in God. Yeah. Well, that's where we're going to have to leave it, so much more I'm sure we could talk about, but, but that's our time. Coach, thanks very, very much. Okay. for talking with us. We certainly appreciate it. And to you all, thank you very much for watching and hope you will join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.